Ian Masters off KPFA now. My name is Steve Zeltzer, and I'm a member of uh, KPFA. And what we see more and more at KPFA is it be, it's become a corporatized media platform. And the management uh, operates unilaterally and uh, without consulting. There used to be a program council at KPFA where the community, the staff and management could actually participate in what kind of programming should be on the station. And they got rid of it. The management with a clique in the, some of the staff, like Brian Edward Teeger and others, uh, they wanted to make KPFA like NPR. That is the direction that they're going. So over the years, this has gotten worse and worse at, at KPFA. And in April, uh, they brought in a new programmer. His name is Ian Masters. Ian Masters uh, has a program briefing report and he was in Los Angeles, and he's a family is uh, ex-CIA people. They were involved in the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, and also he's against left programming. That's what he openly says. In fact, he's so much against it at KPFK in Los Angeles that he was on the air telling people they should not contribute to KPFK. They should boycott Pacifica and boycott KPF KPFK. So after that he resigned because people were very angry that he was trying to destroy KPFK, which has financial problems. So what happened in April, uh, the manager here, Antonio, unilaterally, without consulting the staff, without consulting listeners, brought on this guy, Ian Masters, for five days a week from six to seven, and then they replay him uh, on KPFA in the afternoon. And what we're saying is, is that this is wrong, that Ian Masters uh, has said on the air uh, that Mumia is guilty, he should be in prison. He's brought on ex-FBI and FCIA agents. Why do we need that at KPFA? Why, why do we need these kind of people on KPFA? They're already on ABC, NBC, MSNBC, CNN. These people are on all the time, 24 hours a day. Do we need that at KPFA? So we are having this rally today and we're urging all people who are concerned about making KPFA an anti-war uh, platform uh, to join KPFA and vote for a slate that we're having of Rescue Pacifica, rescuepacifica.net. Because we still have the right to participate and vote and that's something they want to change. They tried to change the bylaws to corporatize them, the present management of the station with the support of the local station board members so the local station board wouldn't have any power. And these people want to eliminate any kind of democratic governance at KPFA. So these are some of the issues we're facing and we're urging again people to join KPFA, to, to run in the election, and to make a statement. For $25 you can join KPFA, you can actually put a statement up, which is great. I mean, you know, where else can you do that? If you run in a local elections, the local elections have become so bureaucratized, you have to put in thousands of dollars, you're fighting corporate media, but we still have the right at KPFA to actually run and make a statement. And they're gonna be statements, so we urge people to join Rescue Pacifica to get involved. So our first speaker is Donna Carter. Donna Carter is just retired as a nurse at Alta Bates Hospital here in Berkeley. We need more working people, actually, on the board of KPFA. We have a lot of lawyers on the local station board. <laughs> But I think we have too many lawyers and not enough workers. So uh, Donna Carter is a member, was a member of CNA and was on strike, and I've interviewed her and others. So welcome, Donna Carter. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I am on the listener station board, and I'm also a member of Rescue Pacifica. We, um, we often find that, as Steve mentioned, the uh, rightward shift of KPFA is found on the listener station board. When we, yeah. when we uh, attempt to bring issues of uh, police brutality, uh, support for our staff, and uh, other issues uh, in terms of um, having a discussion on the listener station board, we are shut out and not allowed to speak. Uh, the board unfortunately it does not it's not a listener stationer board it's a rubber stamp for the uh, views of the management and uh, the push towards uh, conservative or uh, NPR type programming um, so this Ian Masters issue is serious because I think there's significant 
problems with him being on, on the air five days a week, if at all. So uh, I encourage you to continue voicing your opposition to this, and uh, thank you very much. One of the things about the war propaganda that's going on in this country is that while we're spending trillions of dollars for war, over a hundred million dollars in Ukraine, unlimited money for budget, uh, health care is being shut down for working people, Medicaid is being cut off, uh, COVID uh, funding for people who got COVID is being cut off, but trillions are going to war and this station used to be uh, a station opposed to war, opposed to militarism. But what you have on the air here are people saying, well, we have to defend democracy in Ukraine. We have to defend democracy in Ukraine. We have to support the U.S. sending more weapons to Ukraine. Is this KPFA? Is this the kind of KPFA that we want? That's, that's urging more war uh, material being sent to Ukraine and also to Asia, to militarize Asia. The United States is building a base in Okinawa. The United States is building a, wants to build a nuclear submarine base in Australia. How many bases do we need? We have over 800. This station, you wouldn't know about that at this station on most of the programs. Now, some programs do discuss it, but most of the news department here at KPFA, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about the expansion of U.S. militarism and the danger of a global war. So our next speaker has been an activist, doctor, a public health doctor. He also is running for the local station board. He's the candidate that I support and others. He's going to be running with Rescue Pacifica and he's been a vocal critic uh, uh, of the attack on public health also for the war dangers. So welcome Navin Gordon. One of the most important issues facing the planet today is the U.S. push towards nuclear war. There's, there's global warming, yes. There are other issues, but right now we're at a crucial time in history. And the U.S. is doing everything to accelerate this war in Ukraine. For years now, they've built this up. In spite of defeat after defeat, they have made no move towards negotiating any kind of peaceful settlement. They're pouring weapons, as Steve has said, into Ukraine. Every, every month they tell us, well, we won't do this, but then we send it. We won't send this, but then we send it. We won't send this kind of rocket, then we send it. We won't. Now they're talking about sending fighter planes, which can be equipped with nuclear weapons. So the U.S. has engaged in eco-terrorism with Ukraine, blowing up pipelines, gas pipelines, ammonia pipelines, blowing up bridges, blowing up dams possibly blowing, attacking nuclear plants. And what we need is a station that exposes the massive lies and propaganda that's taking place now. That you cannot read almost anywhere now what has really been going on since 2014 and earlier in Ukraine. That uh, this neo-Nazi government that's been built up to literally attack Russia. This is what it's all about. And we are confronting now, for the first time, the U.S. is confronting a military that is a powerful military. We're not talking about the U.S. dropping bombs on Afghanistan or on Iraq, smaller countries, little countries. We're talking about taking on a nuclear power. This is bringing us closest ever to nuclear war, and we are getting closer by the day. The one thing that can stop this is when the people eyes are opened and KPFA can help open people's eyes and get the masses of people in this country into the street to stop this militarization towards nuclear war before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you, Navin. And as I said, we need more doctors, we need more healthcare workers, we need longshore workers, we need workers on that local station board because right now uh, it's dominated by lawyers, it's dominated by people that have sued the station. Uh, these people have been suing KPFA and Pacifica with lawsuits. In fact, they said that the last election, they actually won. This is uh, what they said. Akio Tanaka said they won the last election, so they sued Pacifica, costing uh, thousands of dollars. Over, over $600,000 has been spent on these lawsuits. They're militia lawsuits. They're basically lawsuits to destroy Pacifica. Then they complain there's not enough money, but then they're suing Pacifica with lawsuits. I would say that's a corporate tactic 
that these people are using, and they have millions of dollars, apparently, unlimited amount of money to sue Pacifica uh, in order to drain it of funds. So our next speaker uh, has a long history of fighting. Uh, there's a group here called Save KPFA. They usurped a name for earlier KPFA, but he has been fighting against militarism and also for the Palestinians because it's interesting at KPFA that while they have unlimited time on the news department to talk about Ukraine, they have very little time to talk about the terrorism and genocide against the Palestinian people. Why is that? Isn't that a fight for democracy? For the Palestinian people to be able to live in Palestine without being bombed? That is not an issue for KPFA news. That is not an issue for KPFA news. They're more interested in giving money to continue the war in Ukraine. So welcome, Jeffrey Blankford. First, I'd like to honor the memory of a great resident of Berkeley named Gus Newport, who died the day after Daniel Ellsberg did, who was the only Palestinian, excuse me, the only political politician in the state of California from the border of San Diego to Oregon to support the Palestinians. And he, he, was, he did that from the beginning to the end, a great person. Um, 20 years ago, he was the general manager here for nine months. Why only nine months? Because the entrenched staff of KPFA, which is still the same entrenched staff, undermined him as he undermined other general managers. And so what I was going to say today and let you know about something that few people know about is a sordid history of Pacifica and KPFA when it comes to the issue of the Palestinians. It's not just now, it's been since I became associated around the station back in, in the 1970s. So I have a little chronology I'm gonna go through here. In 1959, Welsh radio journalist Colin Edwards began sending programs to Pacifica Public Affairs Director Elsa Knight Thompson, very famous and revered in the Pacifica and KPFA history. Uh, he sent him from around the world dealing with political and military affairs until he was banned by what he called the Zion Curtain. And so Europe was already frozen for many programs that criticized Israel. So he began sending him to Pacific thinking he found a home here. It was until he began to send programs on the Israel-Palestine conflict that were considered critical of Israel's actions that it turned out that Thompson, who considered herself a Zionist, ran the curtain down here. Edwards had regularly sent tapes from wherever he was going in the world and he would send them to Elsa Knight Thompson and she would put them on the air in convenient spaces. There was a lot more airspace at that time. Until finally, he sent, in 1970, he sent a tape that she didn't run. Um, here's how Colin Edwards described it. In May 1970, Mrs. Thompson was promoted to program director, and Don Portia, who had been the news director, succeeded her as public affairs director. He discovered that for the third anniversary week of the June 1967 war, she had scheduled eight programs produced in Israel on or by Zionist organizations in the United States. In the cupboard, he found the tapes of my recent Middle East documentaries, wrote Edwards, that she had chosen not to air. So he decided to put five of these on the same week as the eight Zionist programs to provide some sort of balance. Mrs. Thompson had gone on vacation but when she, and the first of my latest documentaries had been broadcast bringing on a storm of protests from local Zionists. She rushed back. Portia lost a job and the last two or three programs of mine were canceled. That was the beginning. In 1974, third world programmers filed a challenge to KPFA's license on grounds of discrimination hiring practices. The lawyer representing was a guy named David Salniker. He later became general manager here and executive director of Pacifica. When Salniker became general manager, he issued instructions to the programmers not to mention the word Zionism or discuss Zionism on the air. Thus, when Philip Muldari won the entrenched staff, then one of the hosts of the morning show, 
and we're talking about the 1980s, and he's interviewing Stanford professor Joel Bainan, talking about some aspect of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, Bainan prefaces his response to one of the questions from Philip Muldari, saying, well, he would have to go into the history of Zionism to answer the question, and Philip said, uh-oh, uh, we better not go there, and so they didn't. That's a real journalist, a real programmer, a real professional, Philip Muldari. Um, in 1983, Sonica removed from KPFA the airwaves without explanation a unique program originating from Tel Aviv, which reported on what was happening in Israeli politics. An incredible program. There's never been anything like it before or after. Um, later that year, I was in Israel in a meeting of Tel Aviv with Yesh Gavul, Israeli resistors to the war in Lebanon, and the program host, Amos Wallin, was there. And I said to him, what happened? Why are you off the air? He said, come to my office tomorrow morning, I'll show you. So I went to his office and he pulled out a letter from which I have, I don't have it with me, just a one-page letter from New Jewish Agenda, an organization formed to neutralize Palestinian and Arab antagonism toward Israel, which I, doc I document in New Jewish Agenda papers. Anyway, they said one line, please take Amos Swaleen off the air because of anti-Israeli attitude signed by seven members of the New Jewish Agenda, including an Israeli, Michelle Rubelev, who I thought was anti-Zionist. He was posing as one. Um, let's go on to the, um, In 1985, when I returned to the Bay Area, I went to see Salnikar and confronted him with a letter. He angrily denied it, got very angry with me, and he said the reason we took him off the air was it because of his accent? It was bullshit. Because his accent was no worse than any other accent. It was easy to read here. And KPFK actually kept him on the air. So in KPFK, I guess they could understand it better. Um, in 1985, when I was on Mama Shea's O'Shea's Friday program, which was replaced by Governor to be Jerry Brown by Pat Scott, um, uh, I was plugging a protest. I'd organized in front of the Israeli consulate against Israel's collaboration with South Africa and arming El Salvador, the conscious Nicaragua and Guatemala death squads. A pro-Israel listener called in and defending Zionism. I hadn't mentioned it, so I challenged him about Zionism on the air. Afterward, uh, David Sonica got mad at Mama O'Shea, not me, because he didn't have the guts to do that. She, she should have stopped the program right there and, and not let him get into the discussion. Um, not long thereafter, Barry Scott, who was the head of the Third World Department, invited to be, me to be on her Saturday night program, a two-hour program, talking about Zionism. But Barry Scott was a strong black woman, and Salinger did not have the cojones to challenge her. Um, now, it Salinger became, in 1986, for his great work, he was promoted to executive director of Pacifica. And he appointed Pat Scott to be his general manager. And Pat, with whom I was friendly, um, told me one day um, about a problem I was creating with Pacifica and the news department. It, one day, Phyllis Bennis, who was on the air frequently, as the expert around Palestine, was walking by me and casually said, you, you know that she mentioned the name, the program uh, reporter, a correspondent from, for Pacifica on the Israel-Palestine question was an employee of Israeli state radio. And she laughed about it and she, she had done nothing about that. But I did, I called Israeli state radio the next day and I asked for this guy. And the, what the operator said, he has three extensions. Which one do you want? Well, I hung up. And I began calling Pacific and telling him to get this guy off the air. Pat Scott, who, who was then friendly with me, told me that Pacific News Department, supposed to be the alternative to NPR, was complaining because I was harassing them about them hiring 
and, and having this guy on the air. Finally, I got my way. I was a one-person campaign. And he was fired. Who did they replace him with? One of the chief speechwriters for Benjamin Netanyahu. And you can't make this up. It only took me about a week or so to get rid of him. But this is what we are dealing with. Um, now I'm going to jump ahead to 1993. Yasser Arafat had surrendered to Israel. It took the form of something called the Oslo Accords. Professor Hatem Bayesian and I had made arrangements to do a program at La Pena in Berkeley to oppose the Oslo Accords. And so we came on the morning show to talk about it. And the first thing Philip and Chris Welsh, who are the co-hosts, said to us, don't you guys like peace? And then to me, they said, we don't want you talking about the ADL case. The ADL case was a case of the largest Jewish so-called defense organization, had a national spying campaign, which got exposed in the beginning by the San Francisco Police Department of all groups. And I had exposed their main spy who came to infiltrate the organization that Steve and I started called the Labor Committee on the Middle East. And this had been made headlines all over the world. I had been personally attacked in the Jerusalem Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Jewish Week, and the Jewish Forward, and they told me, don't talk about it. Well, in fact, the station would not talk about the ADL spy case. Only Dennis Bernstein info interviewed me, but that was basically it. Um, shut the door on the news when it came to criticizing a Zionist organization. Um, now, at the end of 1969, 1999, I left the area and went north to Mendocino County. And so I wasn't monitoring and listening to the station. And so I was amazed to find uh, last year that a guy named Quincy McCoy had become the general manager of KPFA. Quincy McCoy, I knew the name because in 2011, Middle East Children's Alliance, Barbara Lubin, had arranged at the Children's Museum of Art in Oakland to have an exhibition of paintings of Gaza kids who had been victims of the bombing of fascist Israel. Um, and that was going to be an exhibition in Oakland by a, a reputable uh, uh, museum, the Children's Art Museum. But the Jewish Community Relations Council, of which there are 157 in the United States, they're like the first advanced line of of Israel in, in cities around the country, they put pressure on Quincy McCoy and he canceled the exhibit. That someone like that should have been allowed to be general manager of the station doesn't say much for the station, of course, but there should have been protests out here. If I had known about it, I would have been out here and get on his face. Anyway, he's gone now. Um, so, um, that's as much as I know about that. There are probably other things I've forgotten other people know because they haven't been monitoring the station. But I want to say a couple things about Ian Masters. In 2017 and 2021, he attacked Julian Assange by repeating unproven accusations that came out of the Britain in which the Brits supposedly got him the Spanish who were monitoring, spying on Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy, that Assange was regularly meeting there with Russian agents to whom he was passing documents. Now, I would say without having to go there, I would put my life that that didn't happen. Because every 25 feet in England, in Britain, you have a cameras. The cameras are everywhere, and the idea that the Ecuadorian embassy was not going to be watched by the United States as well as the Brits is not to be believed. And yet in 2017, Ian Masters, now a regular at KPFA, and in 2021 repeated the same nonsense. So the idea that this character uh, is on the air uh, 
is, 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 is simply unbelievable. And one thing about the connection with Palestine, uh, on May 25th, he interviewed a man named Shibli Talhami, an Arab American who I worked with in 1970 when he worked for the American Friends Service Committee. And Shibley is a house Arab for Washington. He's at the Brookings Institution and, um, and uh, I forget what other university. In any case, Shibley has written a book called One State about Palestine and Israel. But it's not a, it's, it's not a, a call for a single state. It's kind of an exposure of what the situation is now watered down. And then at the end, Shibley says, and it's just amazing that the Biden administration veto UN resolution opposing the settlements. How could he do that? And Ian Master says, yes, I'm wondering about that. Why does the Biden administration veto a resolution, UN resolution? That was U.S. policy. And they, they went back and forth about that without saying it was the Israel lobby, which never gets mentioned. And this is what it was. But Shibley, at least, knows better. But he's become a, a you know, a, a, a running dog for the Zionists. And this is what, and, and so has the station, in a sense. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. And again, supporters uh, who want a vibrant activist, uh, KPFA and Pacifica, please join uh, KPFA let your voice heard because uh, the faction that runs KPFA and is trying to destroy it, save KPFA, the old save KPFA, save KPFA, they took the name from Jeff's organization actually and used it and they've other, the protectors, they call themselves the protectors. Uh, there's a lawyer who is in, ahead of the protectors and, and she's, uh, you know, she's involved in suing Pacifica, suing KPFA. So they're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to sue uh, Pacifica to take in this corporate takeover. And if people, a lot of people have left KPFA, they don't listen to it. That's why their listenership is dropping. That's why people are dropping away. They don't cover live struggle. There was a rally three blocks from here, four blocks of the Nazis. Uh, ABC, NBC, uh, NBC were covering it live. Where was KPFA? There are live struggles going on of teachers, of other workers, uh, and KPFA management does not want to cover these struggles live. They don't want to do that because it would interrupt their programming. Well, you know, it's time in this country to fight fascism, to fight what's going on, the war, that we do interrupt programming. In fact, they do it in commercial programming all the time. They interrupt programming. How about interrupting program for a mass workers' demonstration? Is that too radical at KPFA to cover a mass workers' demonstration live? One of the reasons KPFA had tremendous support is it covered the free speech movement live at Sprawl Plaza. And that was how many years ago? 60 years ago, they covered the free speech movement live on KPFA with mobile units when you didn't have the internet, when you didn't have live program, but they can't do it now because the management is against it. I was on the local station board fighting for that. I said we should do live programming. We should be doing live video, not just uh, uh, audio, but video programming. They were against it. And, and these people who run the station, oh, there are too many obstacles to do that. Well, actually, TV and radio stations are combining. Radio stations now have a video as well as, as uh, TV, but not at KPFA. We have to be a multimedia platform, and that's our vision at uh, Rescue Pacifica and Pacifica Fight Back. So our next speaker is, also has a long history of struggle for the Palestinian people. Uh, and for democratic rights, worker rights, and was a reporter from the Chronicle who actually was witch hunted out of the Chronicle for covering what was going on with Intel's investment in Israel, where they're building plants on occupied Palestinian land. So welcome, Henry Knorr. As Steve said, I, I was on the LSB local station board for six years, I think from 2004 to 2010 or something like that. And when I first ran, I, uh, I wasn't really familiar with all this history. I hadn't been paying a lot of attention to KPFA until after I got fired from the Chronicle. I started listening more. And I ran, you know, I came up with a very detailed platform of a whole bunch of concrete suggestions about including live things and video. 
about things, concrete ways to make the station better. I was kind of naive about the management and the politics. I didn't realize what I was up against. And uh, I thought, how could anybody object to all this? So I got elected two terms. And I, what, <laughs> what I learned was, you know, both the management and the entrenched staff, they didn't pay the slightest bit of attention. They didn't give a damn. It wasn't even in that. It was the politics. It wasn't the content of the, my suggestions. It was just they didn't want to hear from anybody. They wanted a total monopoly of control. And no matter how constructive and innocuous politically the things I was suggesting were, they wouldn't hear of it. But I don't want to talk anymore about that. The kind of a bad experience. I just want to tell a real quick story from a recent thing that raises a somewhat separate but I think related issue. Um, a couple of weeks ago on the evening news they ran a story by a reporter named Edwin J. Vieira from something called the Public News Service. I don't know what it is. Um, about Biden. Biden recently issued a hundred page program for fighting anti-Semitism. Okay, I'm, I'm against anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, I don't know, it seems to me Islamophobia is a much more serious problem and we don't have a Biden issuing a platform for that. But the, the, this report from Edwin, and I looked at this Biden's platform, it's mostly just a bunch of hot air, you know, we should have tolerance and this and that. And we're going to direct all federal agencies to make sure everybody tolerates Jews. <laughs> Um, but most of this report was given over by this reporter to an interview with a woman from the American Jewish Committee, which is, uh, among other things, an ardent Zionist, an ardent fan of Israel, promoter of Zionism in, in Israel. And she used her, her interview to talk all the time about something, uh, a definition of anti-Semitism which has been developed by an entity called the International Holocaust Remembrance uh, A. What's the A? Uh, association or something. IHRA. Anyway. Um, and this definition of anti, so called definition of anti Semitism, it comes with 11 examples of anti Semitism. Um, Seven of the 11 are really about criticizing Israel. They're saying that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. This IHRA definition is something the Zionists are actively promoting all over the country, in fact, all over the world. Uh, it's just a recent study about how all the harm it's done in Europe and um, helping to repress anti-Zionist activism in Europe. The Zionists are promoting it in um, state, a whole bunch of state governments have officially enacted it into their laws and they're penalizing people who won't agree to it and this and that. And so this report had gave all this time to this woman to promote this definition and say, well, this is a really useful tool for fighting anti-Semitism, when in fact it's really a tool for promoting Zionism. And there was not a word uh, in the report of any the fact that there might even be another side to this question of the IHRA definition, even though it's widely known to anybody who pays attention that this is a tool that's being used to struggle against activists, uh, Palestinian Americans, other Arab Americans, and anybody else who's critical of Israel. And there was, there, there was not a word of, of any distance, any, uh, any notion that it might be another definition or some people might not agree with this definition or whatever. So, and I imagine the reporter was just naive. I think he just wasn't well informed. He could have Googled and found out in two seconds that this is a, a, a big controversy, but he didn't. So I wrote him an email. It wasn't very, it wasn't polemical. I just pointed out that actually this definition is not what it seems. And you should look at this, and I sent a few links, and I set, explained why, how it was being used, and saying that I was really disappointed to hear this being promoted on KPFA's air. I sent it to the general manager, I sent it to the news department, 
I sent it to Eileen Alfandari, uh, I, a bunch of different people, and to the reporter himself, this Vieira guy. And, um, you know, I didn't get a single, a single response from any of them, not even a pro forma, thank you, or we've received your comments, or we'll look into it, or anything like that. Or, you know, ideally, you know, good point. Oh, and I suggested maybe they should have something on the air countering this. Not a word. And that, that, that to me is a, it's a related issue, which, which is the singularly, singular lack of responsiveness on the part of the station. It's supposed to be community radio, and they don't pay any attention. I mean, I'm just one person, right? I didn't expect any special treatment. But I know when I was a reporter at the Chronicle, and before that, in other jobs, if I got a letter, an email or whatever from a reader, I would respond. You know, even with something quick, or, you know, even with didn't go into detail. But I, I took that as part of my job. I'm supposed to interact, you know. And these guys, not a peep, not a syllable, nothing. And I think that's part of the problem. They just want to run their little show. They're running it into the ground as it happens. But I think they, they, they don't even care about that. They're willing to run it into the ground if they can just ignore what's going on around them in the rest of the world and their community that they pretend to serve. One of the issues that we are very concerned about is the danger of, of war in Asia with the Asian pivot and the Biden administration before him, uh, Trump and, and Obama and all, all of these politicians. Um, and this is a real danger of, of a war in Asia and uh, encirclement of, of China, uh, Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan to exacerbate the conflict between the United States and China, and uh, what the lessons of that war was and for the United States, because the rise of, of uh, militarism here, the rise of China hate, hate China, hate China's the enemy, China's a dictator. Well, they're dictators we're supporting. In fact, Biden is meeting with dictators and murderers the murder of Khashoggi, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. I mean, isn't he a dictator? I thought he was a dictator. Wasn't he a dictator? In fact, he killed Khashoggi, didn't he? But he's not a dictator according to Biden. We have to oppose militarization in Asia, and Grace is here. Uh, who's an activist in the Comfort Women campaign and other campaigns against militarism because what did we learn in the war in Asia? The United States dropped nuclear bombs in Japan. The only two nuclear bombs that dropped on people in the world were by the United States. And yet the United States is preparing more nuclear weapons, smaller nuclear bombs. So we need to organize and educate people against war and militarism. So welcome, Grace. Uh, my name is Grace Shimizu. And I just want to say I'm Berkeley born, and I'm a longtime listener of KPFA. In fact, it's been this radio station and the news coverage has been so important for my own development as an activist, but also as a human being. You know, and I just want to say that, um, especially uh, the times when our country has been at war, and you know, our country has been at war nonstop. So I became more aware of it during the Vietnam era, through the 9-11. Uh, I mean, where could you hear news, really good news after 9-11, to find out what was going on? And then the Iraq war, all the wars since, and the wars that are coming down. And the thing is, is I always had kind of um, confidence in KPFA that they were going to give us what was happening, the truth. They got people on the ground, they've got connections, they can bring the truth to us. You know, and not only that, we have access to this community run uh, station and news. We can bring what's happening on the ground here out to other people, even in our own community. So what's been really, really becoming appalling is seeing the right word drift of KPFA. You know, the law, the, what we're seeing is the lack of community control and community input. And you can see that if you look closely at the changes that have been happening in the uh, programming and the policies. Now, who can, who can say here 
you know, like, why is this Ian Masters on here? Come on, he got kicked out of LA. Why is he here? You know, and then not supporting Julian Assange and what he represents in terms of uh, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all that kind of stuff. And then Mumia Abu Jamal, come on, not supporting that. I mean, let's just say there's a long list and this has been, uh, you can track it over time. You know, and there's an important elections coming up. This is where the challenge is to our community-based, listener-supported radio. Are we going to let that drift to the right continue? Or are we going to defend the programming? Are we going to defend the reporters? Are we going to defend our own community against this garbage, you know, that is being put out? as news, you know, as analysis. We need to um, stand up and speak out against it. And the reason is, is that, as um, many of the speakers have been saying, is we are in danger. We, war is here. We are in war. We got so many bases around the world, you know, and you know, we know that the warmongers are just uh, setting themselves into better positioning to wage this war. This war is happening. The news about it is being manipulated, right? You know, and people aren't able to get access, but we still have a chance to defend that access. And so I, I ask everybody, you know, in the listening public who is listening to KPFA, don't hold back. This is the time. Come out to this election, vote, you know, and participate. This is our democracy. You know our democracy in this country is, is under threat. This is all connected. If you think what's happening at KPFA is separate than what's going on in our country, wake up. Wake up. And the thing is, is we got community. We got a lot of people. We got people already in the station. We got to support them. You know, and so please come on out, support this uh, effort to defend KPFA and to put it on its right course. Thank you. I want KPFA to, to, to be doing what it should be doing because, you know, basically in this country, KPFA and Pacifica are the only alternative network in the United States. It's the only alternative network, which means that if we lose it to the corporatizers who want to take it over and bring in people like the CIA operative Ian Masters, it will become like all the rest of the media in this country. <laughs> and they don't want this station to be an activist station. They don't want the community. Right now it's dead inside. If you look inside, nobody's there. Why? They haven't opened up the station. Why is that? All the other radio stations in Northern California are open around the country. KPFA is closed? No, there's nobody here. It's nobody here. Who are they protecting or who are they preventing from coming into the station? They're afraid of young people coming into the station. They're afraid of community groups coming into the station. KPFA used to be a beehive of activity. All kinds of people would be coming in, community people, and now it's like a, it's like a morgue. It's like a morgue right here. It's dead. And we got this big building and it's virtually dead. I mean, you know, it is true that programmers can do it remote, but that uh, there are studios here, young people could be coming in, all kinds of people could be programmed. So again, we're going to have Jeffrey Plankford, who knows something about the history of KPFA, the long history of KPFA, has been struggling for a democratic KPFA and a, and a KPFA that exists against genocide and apartheid. Welcome, Jeff. 21 years ago today, I was arrested right here for protesting Pacifica takeover by uh, the corporate folks behind uh, Pacifica at the time. Mary Frances Berry, uh, we had Pat Scott, who had been a friend of mine, who then came in and destroyed all the volunteer programmers and made us a professional radio station. Uh, I found out at the bank roll that for the KPFA is one billion dollar over one billion dollars a year. It's an amazing amount of money. Million dollars. There used to be collective programs, labor, 
on, on human rights, you had freedom as a constant struggle, you had living on Indian time, you had people who had regular jobs were part of the community, and they would share programs, and so they would be input from the community. Instead, under Pat Scott, about 125 programmers were fired, went off the air. There were five programmers from noon to one. They brought in Jerry Brown. Without KPFA, he probably wouldn't have become governor again. Now, actually in 93, early 93, I came to the station. There was a programmers meeting, a staff meeting, because I wanted to protest a new programmer who had put the speechwriter for Netanyahu on the air in 93. But then I found out from Larry Bensky that there was a program, there was a, a plan for Pacifica to become like NPR and to get grants from the major corporations, foundations like Pew and MacArthur and Rockefeller. And in the plan it said, we will tailor our programming to fit their demands. And so I, I put aside my complaint about this one programmer for Israel and started something called Safe KPFA with another person who's not here with us, Werner Hurst, who passed away. And we started Safe KPFA, which is described by Margie Wilkinson and, and their quote, Safe KPFA, as just people complaining about the station where it wasn't important. We had programs at uh, Ashkenaz. We were trying to actually save KPFA, and then it morphed into Take Back KPFA. I went back to the CPB in 1997 because you couldn't get into Pacifica board meetings anymore. They were banned. And even when Jack O'Dell, who used to work with Martin Luther King and was a friend, was the chair, and he said you could have the minutes, he would not give, Pacifica would not give the minutes to listeners. So I wrote a complaint. First of all, I got called by the uh, CPB, Inspector General's office, because a report of the conflict and me being turned out, kicked out of the Pacifica board meeting in Houston, got into a radio magazine, and so they, some of the CPB read it, and the Inspector General's office and called me on the phone and wanted a story. I said, well, I'm not ready to go public. He said, you don't have a choice. This is our business. And so three days later, this guy with very highly rating was fired. Then he was replaced with another guy, the, the head of Inspector General of CPB. And he called me and he listened to my story. He said, I think you have a real case. I'll get back to you at the first of the year, about two months later. First of the year comes, I haven't heard from my call CPB. He was fired. Then a, a Inspector General, when I went back to the CBB, Inspector General had actually come out here, a new one who had been in the Army, interviewed me and my Mariah Gallardi, who was a programmer here, and some other people. And then I, and I wrote a, a legal paper stating all the things that Pacifica and KPFA had done wrong. And he wrote, he made a decision that agreed with me. So I go back there to testify against Jack O'Dell. May he go to hell. Um, and the Inspector General says to me, the CPB says to me, the fix is in. Well, I said, what do you mean? He says, they have taken my report to board and ignored it completely and made a report that whitewashes Pacifica. So he says, they're going to start the meeting. We should go in to separate doors. So I go in. And there's Jack O'Dell staring at me, glaring at me, and here is a CPB praising Pacifica. And a neighbor of mine who lived right down the hall from me, Project Soto, Nicole Sawaya, you may remember her, she was the manager here, she wouldn't even talk to me, she wouldn't look at me, because she didn't want to be associated with me. She didn't want the blood to spread. Uh, but this is what we were dealing with. This has been, and, and Pat Scott was, Pat Scott, when she retired, got a letter of commendation 
from the former head of Radio Marti and Voice of America. The station had been taken over, and you have the, the entrenched staff, none of them, and none, nobody was the new safe KPFA. And I don't want to mention the party they were with. I used to be associated with it. But in any case, not one of them did anything at any time to support us saving the station. To me, they're part of the entrenched enemy. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, we want, as I said, everyone that hears this to join uh, KPFA. If you join it for $25, you could run for the local station board and put out a statement about your vision for KPFA and Pacifica. We have great opportunities. People in this country are hungry for real news. They're hungry for the stories of struggle of the people of this country and around the world. Uh, like in Peru, where 900 U.S. troops have gone to invade Peru to support a military dictatorship. Why isn't that on the news on KPFA? that the United States is sending an invasion force into Peru to occupy the country and murdering people in Peru. It's not being reported because the KPFA news have a corporate agenda, have a pro-war agenda. That's what we have to end. So thank you and solidarity, brothers and sisters.